Hey, it's Chris, and Gary Taubes just came out with a new diet book, The Case for Keto, so naturally some of my friends emailed me and asked what I thought of it. He is one polarizing author. Gary said he tells his vegetarian wife, maybe I'm a quack. All quacks are sure they're right. I took him seriously, though, because he has a bachelor's in physics from Harvard, a master's in aerospace engineering from Stanford, and a master's in journalism from Columbia. Impressive. He raised $40 million to fund nutrition studies from respected scientists. And there is a case for keto. You ditch processed food for one thing, and some people achieve dramatic weight loss. And Gary looks good for a man in his early 60s. And the way you get insulin down is you get them off carbohydrates and you hope like hell that butter and bacon are health foods. In this episode, I'll take you through his boldest claims, that we've been lied to by the authorities, that nutrition scientists are the worst of any field. My second book was called Bad Science. And my physicist friend said, if you're fascinated with bad science, you should look at this stuff in public health. It's terrible. That if we cut the carbs, we'll naturally slim down and get healthy as if by magic. And how it's really unfair to be fat shamed and accused of gluttony and sloth by nutrition experts who are naturally slender, and so they can't understand how some bodies are just different. I'll end the episode with my answer to his biggest question. Is he on to a major breakthrough for people who fatten easily? Or is he a quack? Gary exploded onto the scene in 2002 with the cover story in the New York Times Magazine entitled, What If It's All Been A Big Fat Lie? You have to admit, if you're looking for attention, that's a great title. Anger is the most viral emotion and being lied to by authorities makes people scream. Ah! Definitely worked on me because my heroes are great scientists and to accuse thousands of them of lying over the last few centuries pushes all my buttons. But seriously, if they really did lie or they just got it all wrong, I'm ready to face it. Gary said that story got so much attention, he got a huge advance from a publisher to turn it into a book. The press reported the advance as $700,000. I said in a past episode that almost all successful diets, Mediterranean, keto, whole plant food diets, eliminate the 60% of calories Americans now get from processed foods. Anybody who takes those out of their diet gets a high five from me. In 2019, scientist Kevin Hall from the National Institutes of Health did a fascinating experiment comparing how people do on processed foods versus real food, and shocker, we get more calories and gain weight when we get to eat processed food. I still miss you, Sugar Frosted Flakes and Tony the Tiger. We'll put a tiger on your team, Kellogg's Sugar Frosted Flakes. Speaking of processed food, early in the book, Gary quoted from respected nutrition professor Reginald Passmore, who in 1963 wrote in the British medical journal, Every woman knows that carbohydrate is fattening. This is a piece of common knowledge which few nutritionists would dispute. That really snapped my head back because what respected scientist would make a statement like that, especially in a respected medical journal? I had to go chase that reference. Gary's right. It's the opening line. But the paper quickly explains what they mean by carbohydrate, white bread, jam, and sugar. Well, yeah, if that's your definition of carbs, then every woman does know they make you fat. Doesn't that bring up the question of what a book about carbs means when it uses the term carbs? Since Gary refers to carbs in various ways, I asked a kid to explain them in ways we could all understand. But first we had to go buy some. Carbs with brownies. Oh, grain. I'll explain carbs so simply that even a kid can understand. These are evil carbs. Full of sugar and white flour. The box says oops all berries, but I looked in there and there didn't seem to be any. Now we come to the sneaky carbs. These foods have health claims on the packages. There's more than a tablespoon of sugar mixed into this, baby. These are the type of carbs that everyone fights about. What makes these carbs different from the evil carbs is that the food company didn't remove the fiber. This final group is like the previous group, except lower in calories. Mm. What kids wouldn't know, and Gary doesn't explain, is that fiber is also a carb. All plants have it, no animal foods have it, so it's a good thing Gary's version of keto allows unlimited green vegetables, berries, avocados, and olives. Fiber is the hot new thing now because we're discovering its profound role in gut health and the microbiome. It's what gut bugs munch. That reference to all women knowing that carbs make you fat shook me a little because Gary made it sound like Dr. Passmore was talking about carbs in general, not just white bread, sugar, and jam. So I went to work chasing more references to make sure they were solid, and that meant buying a lot of old books 
going all the way back to 1826. This one is published by a Frenchman Gary says is the father of low-carb diets. I don't speak French, he's got a complicated name. Jean Anthelme. Jean Anthelme Briat Savarin. Briat Savarin. Jean Anthelme Briat Savarin. <laughs> Whatever. Thanks to my son in law for the French lesson. All thin women wish to be fat. This is a wish we've heard expressed a thousand times. Thinness is a terrible misfortune to women to whom beauty is more important than life, and the beauty of whom consists in the roundness and graceful contour of their forms. Fattening regimen. General rule, much fresh bread will be eaten during the day and particular care will be taken not to throw away the crumbs. As much sugar as possible should be put on fruits. Another early reference in the case for keto is Dr. Herman Toller's book, Calories Don't Count, which sold 2 million copies in 1961. Notable because it preceded the Atkins diet. I am fascinated by the topic of why we believe what we do so I could not put this book down. Dr. Toller believed the key to weight loss was unsaturated fats because they softened the fat tissue and he recommended drinking three ounces a day of safflower oil. He thought saturated fat in meat and cream was bad as were most carbs except a few like potatoes. He recommended fried foods cooked in margarine or corn oil. Unfortunately, Dr. Toller was convicted of fraud for selling safflower oil pills and claiming they worked for losing weight. He claimed he was duped by his book publisher Simon & Schuster who changed the book without his knowledge. So I was getting very nervous about Gary's sources and I thought I was seeing a pattern I didn't want to believe, which is to quote, hard to find old sources and then misrepresent them. I just couldn't imagine a journalist with his credentials doing that, but best to check and make sure. The next reference I chased was a 1951 textbook that Gary said was seminal, The Practice of Endocrinology. I checked everywhere for that book and finally found one from a used bookseller in France who wanted $144 for it. And that's when my Googling turned up a kindred spirit with a master's in nutrition who had discovered the same things I did about Gary's references. So we zoomed. Yeah, it's it's not easy. A lot of his tech, a lot of the stuff he cites, um, are really old yeah. and kind of obscure. He knew about a digital library I didn't, the Haughty Trust, and they had a scanned copy of the book. And here it is. Sure enough, the textbook listed eight foods to avoid, not just the five that Gary had quoted, and one was excess fat. He also eliminated the line about limiting salt because Gary had written about salt being fine. And he glossed over the line that said we could eat unlimited fruit except for bananas and grapes. The text goes on to say that certain carbs are fine like beets, but not turnips. I wonder if the author felt like most of us do about turnips. I read through more of the text and the impression I get is it's arguing for mostly a balanced diet. The author of that 1951 textbook is Raymond Green, who 19 years later wrote this book, which has a chapter on obesity. He called refined carbs criminal, but he said it doesn't apply to whole grains and vegetables. One fascinating thing about Gary's quotes from old sources is you can Google them and discover dozens of health influencers who plagiarized Gary instead of reading the original source. Here's a simple but incredibly shocking example. In 1953, Ansel Keys published this chart. Moving to the right means more fat in the diet. Moving up means more heart attacks. Ansel felt he had reliable data for six countries, which are the ones on the chart. Whoa, that chart would grab anyone's attention. Two scientists came along four years later and said, we have more recent data and we have it for 22 countries. Although some of it may not be as reliable because countries like France and Mexico were known to have unreliable data. Those two authors said, wow, would you look at that? We see an unmistakable correlation too, but we wonder why it bounces around like that. Norway eats more fat than Finland and has fewer heart attacks. Huh. But hey, we made another chart for animal protein consumption and it has an even stronger correlation. The more animal protein you eat, the more heart attacks you have. A half century later, the journalist Gary Taubes looked at these charts and said, hey, once you include the 22 countries, the correlation between dietary fat and heart disease vanishes. And let's not mention the chart of animal protein and heart attack risk. I mean, come on. Do those two charts look like the data doesn't go up to the right to you? During the half century after those charts were published, Ansel conducted a massive study with more than a dozen scientists with two simple takeaways. One, areas like Greece that ate a lot of fat from olive oil didn't have many heart attacks. Areas like Finland that ate a lot of fat from meat and cheese did. That explains most of the scatter in the chart. And two, a plant-rich Mediterranean diet is super healthy. Here's what's so fascinating. Gary's vanished sentence went viral on the internet, probably because cheese and bacon are delicious, and so anyone who hasn't read the original study thinks Ansel Keys was a chump. Gary has said Ansel is so incompetent, you wouldn't let him work on the plumbing in your house. When I made fun of the scientist 
who was the worst scientist who ever lived, or one of the five worst I'd ever interviewed, who took credit for putting us all on a low-fat diet, and he gets credit for it. He celebrated his 100th birthday <laughs> a few weeks ago. And his mentor also lived to be over 100. Scientists who've read the studies in great detail, as I have, think Ansel was a giant of the field and possibly a genius. To Gary's great credit, however, he did raise $40 million to fund research at the National Institutes of Health, Harvard and Stanford, to see if a carb calorie made you fat while a fat calorie didn't. Unfortunately, the studies didn't show that, so Gary is trying to discredit a couple of the lead researchers. If you want to read about that drama, I'll link to you a Wired article about it, but I'll spare you some of Gary's tweets. Does it really matter if certain types of calories don't magically unlock your fat stores, though? If people lose weight on a keto diet for whatever reason, big win. One of the scientists that Gary funded, Kevin Hall, has gone on to test the very reasonable hypothesis that maybe the reason people lose weight on keto is because they feel less hungry. Awesome. One of the themes throughout the book is that some people fatten easily because they're different from thin people. Nutrition scientists who are often slender can understand that and blame it on gluttony. And sloth. They fat shame. Okay, fat shaming is awful. And I was about to say, I don't remember any diet book authors recently fat shaming their readers. But then I remember the carnivore MD loves to skinny shame Dr. Greger on Twitter. Of course, he chooses photos of Dr. Greger in the most unflattering position and the worst light to maximize the shame. Shamer's gonna shame, I guess. I don't know why he hasn't soy boy shamed guys like Nimai Delgado. I asked a slender doctor if he could understand his overweight patients. Yeah, as someone who used to struggle with weight, I think it's horribly unfair to say that people are automatically skinny or fat. It took me a lot of time and work to get to a healthier place, and no one comes to it Almost no one comes to it naturally. By the way, this is Dr. Bean on the right when he weighed 310 pounds. It got easier as I learned principles of healthy eating, but changes only come through hard work and time, and that's true for all people. I got up to 228 in my 40s as I discovered on a bungee jump in New Zealand. And when I lost 43 by eating mostly whole plants, sometimes people would approach me and say, oh, you're just naturally slender. It must be nice. And I'd think to myself, where's the credit for passing on all those slices of luscious chocolate cake? <sighs> By the way, the smacking sounds you're probably hearing in the background is the smells of that chocolate cake caught the attention of my faithful hound. He's a good dog. And also, I should state for the record that I don't miss chocolate cake anymore. These little cuties are my favorite now. Even when I weighed more than I wanted, I couldn't help but laugh at the nation's most beloved fat shamer, who had something to say about it when he was 95. I needed to hear it back then. A lot of people say, I'm fat because my dad is fat. You're fat because you ate all that junk that your dad was eating to make him fat. Mr. Tops quotes a Dr. Astwood as saying, we know that genes determine stature and hair color, and they determine the size of our feet. So why can't heredity be credited with determining one's shape? If we had doubts that this was the case, let's consider the animals. Consider the pig, he said. His corpulence and gluttony resulted from man's artificial selection. Selective breeding provided us with this hulk, with his hoggish ways, and no one will convince me that his gormandizing is provoked by parental over-solicitude. So the reason the pigs are fat is because of selective breeding. So the reason humans are fat is selective breeding, because people who are obese have more children than those who don't? One of the book's boldest claims is we're not to blame for the obesity crisis. Scientists are. That's a claim the documentary Fathead makes. So after examining all this human history, the experts came to the obvious conclusion. We need to eat a lot more of these. And so they convinced us that human health depends on foods we didn't eat for more than 99% of our entire existence. Here's the logic. The nutritional and academic authorities have failed us, and they and we should acknowledge that. Had they not failed us, we would never have reached this point of epidemic obesity. All this time, I never knew that evil sinus made evil carbs so yummy, convenient, and cheap that immigrants to our country, who are naturally slender in their own countries, are suddenly predisposed to fatten easily when they come to America. So why all the inflammatory language and scientist shaming in this book? Well, I don't think we have to guess because I think Gary tells us. After my 2002 article, 
I was accused of taking a contrarian perspective not because I really thought the evidence supported it, but because it was more newsworthy and would earn me a large book contract. Reporting that the conventional wisdom was indeed right would not. The editors of the New York Times Magazine might not even have published such a version because it wouldn't have been news. He also wrote, The books that can be counted on to sell well are those that promise weight loss and weight control, ideally with little effort, as if by magic. In his effort to discredit conventional wisdom, sometimes he really does just make things up. I know, it sounds like I'm making that up. But I'll let Gary tell his side of the story, then I'll tell mine, and you can choose. Gary's side. As for the idea that a healthy diet must be mostly plants, that it must include fruits, vegetables, whole grains, pulses, and legumes, we don't have even the ambiguous 1960s era studies to support it. We have no meaningful clinical trial evidence to support this idea. My side, doing a PubMed search on plant-based diets, turns up 9,431 results. If you limit the search to randomized control trials, you get 522. There are many great studies in there, I know, because I've read dozens of them. A related and very disturbing thing to me was the deafening silence about mortality. Just go to Google and enter keto mortality and you'll get a long list of grim search results. So let's compare two books I'm very familiar with. One that helps people lose weight by eating mostly whole plants and one that helps them lose weight by reducing almost all carbs. Let's call it a draw for losing the pounds as if by magic without hunger, which I think most studies show. They each get five points for ditching processed foods. Four points for Gary for actually funding respected science. Minus two points for Gary for trying to wreck the reputations of some scientists he funded after the studies reported their results. Two points to Dr. Greger for asking Seth to fact check how not to die. Dr. Greger uh, reached out to me, this was like 2015, I think. Um, he asked me to help fact check one of his books, How Not to Die. So I feel pretty confident about uh, the, things in, the things in that book at least. Minus two points to Gary for blowing Seth off as disgruntled. Two points to Dr. Greger for solid references. Minus two to Gary for insane references. Three points to Greger for the latest science. One point to Gary for historical science. Five points to Greger for addressing all the leading causes of death. One point to Gary for addressing diabetes. Minus three points to Gary for not addressing mortality. Three points to Greger for being all about mortality. Two points to Greger for donating all the proceeds of his book to charity. Minus two points to Gary for releasing a book in the middle of a pandemic and not even mentioning the link between food animals and infectious diseases. Two points to Dr. Greger for publishing How to Survive a Pandemic. Three points to Greger for addressing the environmental impact of farming animals for food. That means a lot to me as an earth scientist. Minus three points to Gary for ignoring the environmental impact of animal agriculture on the planet we all live on. Let's say we have two very different diets, both of which can result in weight loss, and one of them is horrific for the planet, or as Mr. Tobbs puts it, not the best for the planet. Shouldn't we be focusing on the one that actually helps our planet heal? It's in crisis. So I promised to give my opinion at the end about whether Gary's a quack. And I've decided, no, I don't think quack is the right word because he's not a doctor. And to me anyway, the word quack implies you may be misinformed. Honestly, after all this work, I think the most accurate words are the ones that Gary used in his 2000 paper. What if it's all a big fat lie? I think it is. He misrepresented it so grotesquely, um, this stuff, and it, it made me mad.